We're in the beginnings of the Gospel of John. Last Sunday I preached about Jesus cleansing the temple. Today we're going to pick up in the last uh, two verses or three verses of John 2 and going into John chapter 3. And I'll show you why we saved those verses for this section. So join me either using your own Bible, the Blue Pew Bible in front of you, or you can follow along in the bulletin. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs, notice that's plural, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And as you move to your seat, I want you to grab the Bible, your Bible or the Blue Pew Bible, and I want you to turn to the very end of the Gospel of John, to John chapter 21. At the end of his Gospel, and remember the Apostle John, like any of the Gospel writers, any of the writers of the Bible, they are writing God's inerrant word. John, this apostle, is being carried along by the Holy Spirit to give us everything that he believed and was led to print for us. So he comes to the very last verse of his gospel, and this is what he said. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And I want you to just ponder that for a moment. John is letting us know that though he's recorded 21 chapters for us, that Jesus, who lived on this earth 33 years, three years in his ministry, did and said more things, so many more things, that the world itself couldn't contain the books that they were written. That's important to remember. But everything that he wrote, John, the author of this gospel, he wrote for a purpose. He actually tells us this purpose at the end of chapter 20, so it's right near where you are. Look now at John 20, verse 30 and verses, verses 30 and 31. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. We don't know how many, but it was many, many, many so many things that they saw Jesus do. And so many things they heard Jesus say. John continues, but these are written. I have been carried along by the Spirit to write these things. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. If anyone ever asks you, why did John write his gospel? Go to John 20, 30 and 31. This is why. And here's why that matters. Go back to John chapter 2 now. In John's gospel, we are going to encounter so many things that Jesus did and so many things that Jesus said. The I am sayings. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of the life. We're going to see Jesus do miracle after miracle. And we are going to listen to conversations that Jesus had 2,000 plus years ago with real people, real conversations. And Jesus had many conversations. But the, one that, the ones that John has recorded in his gospel are the ones that God wanted you and I and his people, his church, to have until he returns. Every one of these individuals that Christ encounters, these are the ones that the Holy Spirit told John, tell this story. Tell the story of Nicodemus coming in the night. Tell the story of the Samaritan woman coming in the day to the well by herself. Tell the story of Jesus' conversation with the invalid when he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Tell the story of Mary and Martha as they grieve the death of their brother and what Jesus says to the dead man in the tomb. Tell the story of the disciples. As Peter says, if they all fall away, I never will. Tell the story of Thomas who says, unless I put my hand in his side, I will never believe. That happened right before John tells us his purpose of the gospel. These conversations that were real conversations with the living God are the ones that John was carried along by the Holy Spirit to record. And every one of them, every time we read it, has the power to transform our lives. Every one of them have framed within them so many rich theological truths that remind us of who he is and who we are. Who we are in him now and who we are if we are apart from him. And so we come to this conversation that takes place, which is fascinating, between Nicodemus and Jesus. But I wanted to start at the end of chapter 2 for this reason. Let's look there first. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, this is where he was when he cleared the temple, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Already we learn he's doing more things than the gospel writers are telling us. And people are seeing the things that Jesus is doing and they can't explain it. Some are astonished by it and overwhelmed by the glory. Others are very curious. Others are ready to give their lives to Jesus. But verse 24 says, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. That means every person there and every person since and every person before, Christ knows everything about us. There is nothing you can hide from Jesus. He knows exactly what you confessed in our private time a moment ago, what you hope no one will ever know about you, what you might even be trying to hide from yourself. He knows. He knows all people. Verse 25 says, And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now this is why the word man matters and why it's connected to chapter 3. Sometimes when we read our Bibles, we break it up into chapters, and it's not wrong, but these chapter breaks and even headings are not inspired. They're not unhelpful, but sometimes they might cause us to not see a connection. And this is an example. Verse 24 or 25, Jesus says, 
And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in a man. And then John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. It would have been easier and expected for the writer to simply say, and there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Not, and there was a man of the Pharisees. Why is that insignificant? Because Jesus is showing us that just as John tells us he knows all men, he knows what's in a man, he knows what is in every person that he is going to have a conversation with. He knows what is in every authority he is going to confront. He knows what is in every person who needs to be healed. He knows what is in Nicodemus. And what is in Nicodemus is a lot of religion. Nicodemus, it's so interesting that John puts him at the front of his gospel. Nicodemus, we're told, is a man. Jesus knows what's in him. We're told that he is a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus, in many ways, gets a bad rap because we're told that he's a Pharisee. And we know that Jesus encountered the Pharisees, and there's lots of conflict, even from the beginning of the gospel. But you need to know that the Pharisees, in in many places, had sincere faith, really were devoted to the Old Testament, really were seeking in their own understanding to bring God glory, but it went poorly wrong. Jesus is going to say things to people that no one has ever said. Because we've grown up hearing these things, they don't have the same impact that they need to. What Jesus is about to say about rebirth is so shocking and yet so clear. Nicodemus comes on the scene. The Samaritan woman will come on the scene. The invalid will be laying by a pool and Jesus will come on the scene. Every time there is an encounter with a person and there's a conversation that takes place, it's a collision with the one who made them and the only one who can save them. Some come because they're seeking to know who Jesus is. Some simply find themselves in a place that they didn't expect. The woman at the well didn't expect to encounter a man, let alone the Son of Man. She was going for water. She's going to leave with living water. That was not in her orbit. Nicodemus is seeking to know who Jesus is. He approaches Jesus, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I want to make a couple of statements about Nicodemus. I believe Nicodemus is sincere. I believe Nicodemus truly wants to know who Jesus is, and he really does believe that he's from God. I believe Nicodemus is brilliant. Some think because of the way he encountered Christ with the statement that he was aloof, not very sharp. To be a leader of the Jewish people, to be in the Sanhedrin, which wasn't very many people, he was bright. He was intelligent. He was powerful. He was seeking to know who this man was who was doing things that only someone from God could do. And some see the statement, including me, where it says, and he came by night. And we think, ah, he's afraid. He might be afraid. He would have a lot to be fearful of. Think about how little he knows about Jesus. And think about what people are beginning to do as they're responding to Jesus. Think about how frightening that must have been. And so it wouldn't surprise me that he would think, it's best for me to go by night. Though the word we is here. There's a plural. He's either just referencing a part of a group or he's been sent by the group. But just because he comes by night doesn't mean he's a coward. In fact, you might not know this, but it was very ordinary. In fact, the most common way for Pharisees and the Sanhedrin to actually study at night. So it's very possible that he's simply going at the right time to have an earnest discussion with this man. 
The discussion is interesting, though, because Zacchaeus, I'm sorry, Nicodemus, we'll get to Zacchaeus later. Nicodemus doesn't come with a question. He comes with a statement. Rabbi, it's an honorable statement. We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Jesus answers with the phrase, truly, truly. It's the same word for amen. So, amen, amen. It means that what I'm about to say is really important. Three times in this conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus is going to say that. Truly, truly in verse 3. Truly, truly in verse 5. And truly, truly in verse 11. So, the first truly, truly goes like this. Verse 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again... He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, this is important, pay attention. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he speaks about rebirth. The word born again can mean born above. What Jesus is saying is that no one is going to enter the kingdom of God unless that individual person, without exception, has been born again. What does it mean to be born again? In the 70s, when Jimmy Carter was president, In a statement about his faith, he said, I am a born-again Christian. Not long after that, Chuck Colson, who had now been in prison, writes a book called Being Born Again. It was very common for you to hear people who profess faith in Jesus to say, I'm a born-again Christian. Or even to ask, as they told their testimony, when were you born again? Saying I'm a born-again Christian is redundant. It's not wrong to say it, it's just redundant because every Christian has to be born again. If you're not someone who has been born again, you are not a Christian. You are not saved. You don't have assurance of salvation. Now, this is why these conversations are so significant. Of all the people that you would think would be entering the kingdom of heaven, it would be Nicodemus. You wouldn't think that about the Samaritan woman. But Nicodemus, he is living by the law. He's part of a group that will even add to the law to make sure they protect it. He's respected. He hates sin. There's a sincerity to his faith. And John puts this encounter with Nicodemus at the front of this gospel because what he wants Nicodemus to know, and everyone who will hear this story told until Christ returns, is that no one, no religious leader, No person born into a godly family. No person gets into heaven just because their grandma is a strong Christian and has prayed for them. No one gets into heaven just because they belong to a church that preaches Jesus. No one is going to heaven who has not truly, truly been born again. Being born again means that we admit that in our birth, in our natural birth, we are born sinners separated from God. And in order for us to have salvation, there has to be a moment where the Holy Spirit moves. Pictured here is wind in verse 8. And when the Holy Spirit moves... He moves on people who, spiritually speaking, are dead. They're not spiritually sick. They're not a little bit 
immoral. They have no heart that can beat for God. Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He didn't say you were sick. He didn't say you were a little bit ill. He didn't say you had a spiritual common cold. He said, and you were dead as he was dead, as I was dead, as Nicodemus was dead. And Jesus is saying at the beginning of John's gospel, even you, Nicodemus, to whom everybody would look at, and if they were ranking one to the last, who would get into heaven, you would be pretty high on the list. Unless you are born again, unless the Jews are born again, unless any person is born again, they're not going to see or enter my kingdom. Nobody has ever spoken like this. The only time the Jews would hear language about being born again had to do with when a Gentile would come to faith essentially in Judaism. They would call the Gentile proselyte one who was being born again. But they would never refer to their own as being born again because they didn't have to be. They were born in. They were in the family. Now, there were those that were in the family that didn't act like it, so they probably were rejected. Nicodemus never thought he would be somebody that had to be born again. And in this conversation that the Holy Spirit made sure that John recorded for us, he's making clear that we, 2,000 plus years later, would understand that no one, no one, no one is getting into heaven because of their flesh. No one is getting in because of their name, connected to a name of somebody who does believe. The only way we get into heaven and have eternal life is if we're born again. So how are we born again? Jesus answers the question that Nicodemus asks. He says in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The water and the Spirit, those are interesting phrases. They have caused conflict, maybe that's too strong a word, but definitely disagreement among theologians about what they mean, at least the word water. The essence of the passage is clear. If you're not born from above, if you're not born again, if the Spirit doesn't do a work in you that takes you from death to life, then you'll never have salvation. But what did he mean by water? Some want to apply baptism here. That's not what it's pointing to. It's not something Nicodemus would have even understood. Some actually think it has to do with the physical birth compared to the spiritual. And the water is like, and like fluid that comes out of a natural birth. It's not what he's talking about. Most likely Jesus, because he's speaking to a scholar who knows the Old Testament, is saying things that would cause Nicodemus to recognize that what was spoken in the prophets is now being fulfilled. Just listen to this one. Look it up later, but listen to this one. From Ezekiel 36, 25, God speaks, I will sprinkle clean water on you. He's speaking of his people. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The next chapter of Ezekiel is the valley of dry bones. And this really happened where there were bones representing just that which is dead. And the prophet speaks and suddenly that which is dead comes to life. That is what has to happen in the life of anyone who is saved by Jesus. And it happens to everyone who is saved by Christ without exception. The water symbolized in John over 20 times is powerful signifying the Word and the Spirit, the work of Christ and the Spirit. The water symbolizing cleansing 
and life. The Spirit symbolizing the resurrection power. Jesus makes it even more clear as he moves into verse 8, and he says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. If you're a Christian, you were born again. If you are a Christian, you were born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. This is not a message just for those who are lost. It is. And today, if you find yourself here and you're saying, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm born again. And that bothers you. And you want to know, that means the wind is blowing. The Spirit is blowing. Be like Nicodemus and come and ask your questions. Ask Jesus your questions. The questions you ask him, you're asking to the same one who is speaking to Nicodemus. If you're in Christ, though, that means that at some point in your life, the wind blew. Some of you might have been a little boy or a little girl. You might not actually even remember it, but you remember your parents telling you about it. It might seem more like a gentle wind that you can barely remember, but yet it really happened. And the temptation for you is to think and say things like, I don't really have a testimony. I want to take that thought out of your head right now. The reason you might say that is because you've heard other people whose testimony seems more like the kind of hurricane winds we've seen lately on the news. They blow hard. They rip off roofs. You might think of the Apostle Paul. Before he was called Paul, he was known as Saul of Tarsus, and he was killing Christians. He was on his way to persecute more Christians when a hurricane-force wind stopped him. And it was Jesus himself saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's blinded. Here's what I want you to hear. Whether your testimony involves that kind of hurricane force or if it's one that was more gentle, you don't even know the exact time or day or year or month, it took the same power to save you, to cause you to be born again as it did Saul. No less power. You have a testimony. And your testimony sounds something like this. I was born again at the age of around, and that's no less powerful than the woman or man who has a testimony that looks more like hurricane force swells. It took the same power because Saul was dead in his trespasses and sins, and Mark was dead in my trespasses and sins. And whenever the wind blew in your life, and it might be today, October 13th, 2024, whenever the wind blew, whenever the Spirit blew, you begin to think thoughts you would never think. You begin to have desires you would never have. You're going to see that as we unpack these conversations that Jesus is having. And you may hear things that shock you just like they shocked Nicodemus. But because they're from the mouth of the Lord, they're true. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. He will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Last thing this morning, Jesus ends this section just before we have the famous John 3.16. John records Jesus as saying, to Nicodemus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Once again, this is why John has given us this story. The reference to Moses and the serpent is recorded in the book of Numbers 21, beginning at verse 4. 
And it's when the people of God, after being set free from the Egyptians, after God had sent all the plagues, are now wandering in the wilderness and they're beginning to complain against God and against Moses. And God has had enough. And so now the one who sent the plagues against the Egyptians has sent this plague upon his own people. Why would he do that? To bring them to repentance? And as the serpents scatter across the land, real serpents with real poison, they bite the people, and it says many died. The people then come to repentance, and they say to Moses, we have acted ungodly, we have sinned. Pray to the Lord for us. And he does, and the Lord tells him to put a serpent, a brass serpent on a stick and lift it up. And whoever looks at that serpent, even though they've been bitten, And poison is in them, and it will kill them if they don't look. If they look, they will be saved. It really happened. So Jesus is referencing this as he closes this conversation with Nicodemus. And he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That statement, lifted up, had two meanings. One meaning meaning was to be exalted. And the other meaning, which everybody knew, was speaking of the cross. Well, Jesus would do both. He would be lifted up on the cross. And Nicodemus has no idea that that's coming, nor does anyone else. And as he's lifted up and he dies, he will be exalted. What Nicodemus couldn't have imagined is that three years after this conversation, when that man who knows all men and died for them anyway, died for us anyway, that that man who came in the night would now come in the day the darkest day in the history of the world. And he would have with him 75 pounds of ointment and spices to take care of the man who told him, you must be born again to see the kingdom. Have you been born again? Has the wind moved in your life and you've said, I receive Jesus who alone can save me? If you know that you have, if you know that you've been born again, come to this table and feast with gratitude. If today you're hearing things, and like Nicodemus, you've never heard anything like this, Come, say yes to the Savior. Tell him you're a sinner in need of his grace. Ask for forgiveness and rest in Jesus alone. But if today you know that's not where you are, you're either not interested or you're unsure, I pray that you'll continue to think about these things I think it's highly possible that God has you here because the wind that you can't see is beginning to blow. Ask me or Tommy or any of the elders you see down here any question you have. But don't come to this table today lest you eat and drink judgment on yourself. But don't waste this moment either. Truly, truly, You have heard his word. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter his kingdom. Father in heaven, because of your son's life and his death, his resurrection, his reign, his promised return, we who are in Jesus have absolute security now and forever. Lord, if there are those in our midst who want that security, hear their prayers even now. Friend, pray to Christ for salvation. Lord, as we come to this table, 
May we come so thankful, so full of joy, remembering that we weren't just a little bit sick and needed a small dose of medicine. We were dead, and we've been made alive now and forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?